I think I'll uh, I'll kick off because we only have an hour and there's so much to talk about um, and I really want to bring as many people in at the end as, as we can so um, thank you and welcome. Um, thank you so much for having me here this evening to talk to you at SMEs for Labour. Um, thank you particularly to Ibrahim and Busi for putting this event on. Um, for those of you that don't know, my name's Anna Turley. Um, I was the MP here in Redcar between 2015 and 2019, and I was absolutely delighted to be asked to do this event because I've lived and breathed Red Wall and its issues for the last nine years, um, had thousands and thousands of conversations on the doorsteps and on the phone and in the pubs and in the, uh, you know, uh, hairdressers and everything over these years. And obviously, you know, I, I was one of the uh, the many seats that we lost in December 2019, which, of course, you know, I'm sure all of you here have, you know, some very difficult experiences from. And I don't need to remind you, you know, a hugely seismic uh, election for Labour. We saw a 60 seat loss and Labour's joint worst ever performance in opposition and now our 202 MPs are the lowest number since 1935 so we're in a, had a difficult time um, and there's someone who has followed Labour's ups and downs and trends throughout many many years and so I was delighted to have the chance to have this conversation with our pollster Deborah Mattinson. Um, I followed her work for a long time she's had a, always had a really really good understanding of where the British public are and where Labour ought to be. Um, she's had to deliver a lot of difficult messages to a lot of Labour leaders over the years including Neil Kipp, Don Smith, Gordon Brown um, and you can see I think talk behind me um, talking to a brick wall which I enjoyed uh, as someone who was just a few feet from the Gillian Duffy and Jordan, Gordon Brown conversation in 2010. Um, so she's done a lot of fantastic work and it's my privilege to be talking to her this evening and with all of you that are here um, in the audience. I hope you find it illuminating, thought provoking, and hopefully we can start to sort of think through how we build back together brick by brick. So I'm going to ask Deborah to introduce her book for about 10 minutes or so, and then I've got a few questions I have to ask her myself, and then I'm going to open it up to all of you in the audience. So if you could put your questions in the chat room, that would be great, and I'll bring you in to ask them. I won't read them out for you. So if you could be as brief as you can, that would be great, and we'll probably take them in groups of three. Um, the event's going to be recorded, um, and we will we'll have a photo at the end, but I'll let you know when we're going to take it so you can put on your Zoom faces uh, and make sure that we've got lots of smiles. So. Um, so Deborah, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, and thank you for writing this book. Um, I confess when I read it, I didn't know if it was therapy or trauma or all of that, but it certainly resonated with everything that I'd uh, been hearing on the doorsteps, not just in December, but prior to that as well. Um, and before I bring you in to introduce the book, if I may, I might just take a moment to talk about Rekha because it's so symbolic of um, everything that we're going to talk about tonight. Um, Labour lost Rekha back in 2010 um, and it probably would at that point have definitely been considered a Red Wall seat. And we lost it with a 22% swing against Labour to the Lib Dems. The steelworks had been temporarily mothballed, and despite the best efforts of the Labour government at the time, no buyer was found by the time of the election. So the narrative, however untrue, true that was and I can point to lots of positive things that Labour did in this area but the narrative took hold that Labour had let you down wasn't on your side didn't care about you or your industry or your local identity and took you for granted and just as we saw some of that taking in Scotland as well but I guess I'm a kind of voice for optimism as well because in Redcar we did build back starting in 2012 from the grassroots we built a new team locally that tried to be more dynamic community focused more campaign oriented and we got a 19% swing back to Labour in 2015 so things can shift but but ultimately national leadership matters and people's view of the leader in the party, of who you are, of who you're putting forward to be prime minister, of what you stand for and of what kind of country you want to build with them comes overwhelmingly from the top. So Deborah, I guess starting in a way with that as the sort of classic backdrop uh, to your book, how much do you think of the crumbling as it were of the Red Wall had started prior to 2019 and what lessons did the Labour Party fail to heed from public opinion and elections in the decade prior to that? Yeah, I mean, I th that's a great sort of opening question. And in a way, um, that's my start point, too, because I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what it was that motivated me to write the book in the first place. And it was partly a feeling of sort of guilt, actually, um, because, you know, when I first heard of the uh, the concept of the Red Wall and it was Rachel Sylvester, the Times journalist who, who mentioned it to me, said, oh, the Tories are talking about the Red Wall. That's what, you know, they're targeting the Red Wall. And I asked her to explain it. I've never heard it before. And when she told me what seats she meant, I was so skeptical, you know, because I, I know you, you've talked, Anna, about Red Car, it's slightly different 
Uh, and some of them have been a bit more, um, you know, backwards and forwards. But, you know, you've got somewhere like Bassett Law that's been, uh, you know, Labour since 1935, Lee since 1922, Bishop Auckland, uh, every election bar won since 1918, Sedgefield since 1935. And I remember saying, you know, those working class constituents are fed up with Labour, I grant you that, however, they're not going to vote Tory, they're allergic to the Tories. And I actually went on the Today programme a, a couple of weeks later and said that, which I, on reflection probably wasn't my finest hour as a commentator, because I said, oh, they're talking about the Red Wall, but you know, oh, I don't think so. Anyway, we all know what happened next. Um, and, you know, I mean, you know, we're, we're all here, I guess, because we're Labour supporters. I run a small business as well, actually, so I'm particularly pleased to be here with this, this group. Um, but, you know, we all sat there on election night and we watched what happened, starting with Blythe Valley. And overall, as you know, Labour lost 25 percent of its, it, its, its uh, vote to the Tories. And in fact, one of my kids messaged me that night uh, and said, you know, you've written a book called Talking to a Brick Wall. Now you should go talking to the Red Wall. And I thought, hmm, actually, it's not such a bad idea. And then when I thought about it, and this is where the guilt comes in, I thought that after, frankly, some decades of, of being a pollster and doing a lot of work for Labour, I couldn't recall ever doing any focus groups with the exception of one or two by-elections in any of those red wall seats. Um, and so far as I'm aware, Labour didn't. I mean, it might be things happened that I didn't know about, but I don't think anything much happened. I think that Labour, quite frankly, took those seats for granted. And of course, the Tories didn't bother with them either, because until this red wall analysis was done by James Kanagisori and the Tory um, number cruncher, who was the first person to say, hang on a minute, um, they that means some five million people were completely neglected by the entire political class. And I think that one of the things I thought I wanted to do with the book was sort of to put that right, to really listen to those people, to kind of really understand what was going on. But there was another thing as well. There's one other thing, and this I think this comes quite strongly through the book. It came through a lot of the interviews that I did. It wasn't just that that group of people were neglected by Westminster. It was more than that. They were being judged and sneered at, or they certainly felt that they were for their attitudes. And this was something that came up again and again and again. There was a woman called Yvonne that I interviewed in Darlington who, who talked about this a lot and said that she felt completely hurt and offended by Labour, who she felt basically thought that she was uh, a racist um, and she wasn't. Um, and I, the other thing I'd say is whenever I, I tweeted, I found whenever I tweeted anything about the Red Wall, I would be get lots of sort of troll type remarks where people would say, why do we need to listen to these people? They're idiots, they're racists, they're bigots. You mentioned um, Mrs. Duffy a, a moment ago, Anna, but you know, it was that Mrs. Duffy moment really lit, writ large. And I think one of the things I wanted to say, and I hope this comes through in the book, is that whilst I wouldn't agree with them on everything, everybody that I met in the Red Wall seats that I visited basically were nice, decent people. And I think it's really important to say that they were hardworking, they were very stoical, they sometimes had quite shit lives, actually. Um, they cared about their families, they cared about their communities, they cared about the country. And what I really wanted to do in the book was to try to sort of convey that, and as far as I could, to tell the story of what happened in their words and, 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 and to do that in a very sort of honest way. So that's why I wrote the book. Next point, is the red wall so different? And I think it is, that's another question I'm asked a lot is actually, really, is it that different? And of course, at its most basic, what people in the red wall want is what we all want. Um, decent homes, work, family life, a future for our kids. And in that sense, red wallers are just like everybody else. But there are some factors that make it really difficult and actually make it much harder to achieve those things in those places. So one thing that everywhere I went, and I went to Stoke, I went to Darlington, I went to Hindburn, I, I spent quite a lot of time in Accrington. A lot of the Red Wall towns had absolutely glorious, proud pasts, but very uncertain futures. And the inevitable impact on the people there with low pay, with lack of jobs and so on was palpable. And this is a quote actually from one of the women that I interviewed in Stoke. She said to me, the potteries have all gone now, uh, or those that remain are really basically just museums. The collieries have all gone. And everybody in this room, this was in 
quite a big group that I was chatting to, everybody's families would have worked in one or the other of those. And that's why we've lost our, identi our identity. We just don't know who we are anymore, which I thought was really interesting. And a few facts about Red Wall um, people. They tend to be less well-educated. Only 24% have a degree compared with more than a third in the population as a whole. Their high streets tend to be very run down. And this was sort of palpable, you know, when people would say, it's pretty awful around here. And I, where, where I could, and luckily I did most of my field work just before lockdown at the beginning of last year, you know, going and walking around, they were not wrong. And a popular complaint was about the loss of their department stores and the loss of Marks and Spencer. And I heard that everywhere I went, it was really important. It was like a massive symbol of quality the heart almost being sort of sucked out of their town centres. Um, and then connected with that, a very poor nighttime economy. A lot of the towns I visited were no-go areas at night. You wouldn't dare go there. You wouldn't want your kids to go there. Nothing for kids to do. Um, a lot of people think that the voters in those areas are older. They're not, they're actually middle-aged. Um, but the switcher voters do tend to be a little bit older. So it's an older group of people, but they are very focused on the young people in their families, on their children and on their grandkids. And, um, and this brings with it a, a whole bunch of different attitudes, which probably a lot of people on this call will be very familiar with. I can talk about it a bit more, but two thirds on average in red wall seats voted leave in the Brexit vote as well. So, so why, why did Labour lose? Uh, I'm just going to very briefly cover why I think Labour lost, why I thought the Tories win, because I think you have to one, because I think you have to look at those two things together, what will happen next, and then a very quick postscript, because I went back to some of the people that I interviewed uh, at the start and asked them if their views had changed a year on. So why did Labour lose? Well, this sense of deterioration, this sense of loss basically happened on Labour's watch. And my feeling is that this was a very, very slow car crash that you could almost see happening over a long period of time. That, and what I heard again and again was this sense that in a lot of the seats, Labour had taken that seat for granted. In fact, in many of them, what they had done was to uh, parachute in their favoured son. It was usually a son rather than a favoured daughter um, who would be somebody who Westminster wanted there um, and they would be parachuted in because it was a safe seat. They didn't have to work very hard. They could go up there once a month and the rest of the time just leave staff up there. And then they could just spend their lives building their careers in Westminster. And people felt very neg neglected by that. Um, there is obviously a Corbyn factor and I'm happy to talk about that, but I don't think this was Corbyn's fault. I think he was one element in the mix. Similarly, there is a Brexit factor. Ditto. I don't think that we lost those seats because of Brexit, but it was an element in the mix. There was a much bigger thing that had been happening over a much longer time. And there was this sense, and it comes back to the point that I made a few moments ago, that Labour and Labour people look down on them, the ordinary working class voter. And how it was characterised to me was there was this sense of like snooty graduates from London. This is their expression, not mine. Um, you know, who would descend on them and tell them what they ought to think and knew what they ought to be doing. Um, and how people characterise it, one of the games we play in focus groups sometimes is if this brand or this company, in this instance, political party, um, was a person, what would they eat for dinner? Back in the day, when I first started working um, for the Labour Party, um, this is in the, in the 80s, and I asked that question, it was a pie and a pint. It was a really kind of traditional, um, you know, working class food. Now it's quinoa. And I remember doing some focus groups in Crewe actually, where people said it's quinoa and they really just picked the most sort of outlandish middle-class dish that they could think of. It doesn't even taste very nice. And that was what a labor person would, um, would eat. Two other things, not trusted to run the economy. And in all the time, the decades I've been advising Labour, that's been one of the biggest challenges. It was a challenge that Gordon Brown squarely measured up to and won on uh, to the point where in 1997, we went into that general election level pegging for the first time in a long, long time on trusted to run the economy. And then we quite quickly took over to the point where by 2005, we won that election because we were the most trusted party to run the economy we then went backwards. And that was what happened in 2010. 
And I think that we've lost ground further since then. And then the final point, I think this is very, very, very important. So a lot of the people that I spoke to in the Red Wall um, were very connected to their local communities. A lot of them lived their lives um, you know, kind of in a small number of streets, actually. They didn't have much connection with whatever was the big city near them, be it Newcastle, be it Manchester, be it Birmingham, wherever. Um, but they cared a lot about the country. They are very, very patriotic. And they felt that Labour was not patriotic. Not only not patriotic, they actually felt Labour might be ashamed of the country that it wanted to run. And I think that's just quite an important thing to flag. So that's why Labour lost, but you have to look at that alongside why and how the Tories won. And I think what we saw was a perfect storm of, of Labour being useless, frankly. And often when I said, why did you vote Tory? People would still return to why they felt that they'd not voted Labour. That would be their first response to that question. Um, frustration with Brexit, but Boris was the reason. I hate calling him Boris, but I'm going to call him Boris because they all call him Boris. Um, and what he did, and this is, again, this is a direct quote. One person said to me, what he's done is to de-snobbify the Tories. He gave those people a license to vote Tory. Uh, they felt that he understood them. They felt that he wasn't sort of, you know, there's no side to him as the expression might go, that he was what he was, that he was a very clear communicator and he offered hope and positivity, which is something they felt that they hadn't had for a long time. But in doing that, he has set himself a very high bar. And frankly, they're already a bit disappointed. Which brings to the next thing, what's gonna happen next? I think it is not a shoe in for either party, actually the red wall, both parties are still in a state of flux and obviously COVID has only added to that. And we can come back to the impact of that in, in a moment perhaps. But most of all, those red wallers now need to be wooed. They, I think, in a sense, almost relish after years of neglect their political power and they think their time has come. So they are really looking for stuff. They are looking to be noticed. They are looking to be talked to, which is where, of course, the Tories levelling up agenda comes in. And I'm happy to talk a bit more about that if people are interested to do so. Um, but, you know, it places a very big onus on Labour as well to really reach out and manifestly show that Labour understands them, is with them and is of them. Um, so final bit then, and then I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. Um, but a um, bit of a postscript. So a year on, as we were approaching the anniversary of the election, I decided to go back to some of the people that I'd interviewed because I was incredibly curious. I mean, obviously at that point, when I did the last bit of field work that I did, the last bit was on Zoom because the lockdown, first lockdown had just started, but I was very interested to see how everything that had happened since had impacted on their view. So I asked them to sum up the government in one word, and the word that was used most often, unlucky. Now, I think that is incredibly telling, because I think that tells you that however dissatisfied they are, and they are, I'll come on to that in a moment, um, they are disappointed but they also feel that this government has, has been dealt a very difficult hand and you know, an almost impossible task. And actually they feel slightly sorry for the people that have had to deal with it. And when I asked them to give a score out of 10, those scores I think were forgivingly high, six, seven, eight. I don't think I got anything lower than that. Now, that said, the government's made some mistakes big mistakes, Dominic Cummings is still top of mind in December, they were still talking about Dominic Cummings trip to Barnard Castle, right? So it's a big thing. Um, and Boris Johnson himself, you know, the man that had given them the license to, uh, you know, to, to, to vote Tory, also disappointing. There's a strong sense that he doesn't really have a clear pan. When you, you know, if this politician was an animal, what animal would he be? Well, he's a sheep. He's a sheep who's being chased around a field in one direction by his backbenchers, in another direction by, uh, by his special advisors, in another direction by public opinion, trying to please everybody and with no, you know, no real kind of compass himself. But they also wonder, could anybody have done any better? And they do think that he's a decent person who has tried his hardest. Now that might not be your view, but it is very much what they feel. So, um, 
they are still eagerly awaiting for the leveling up to happen, um, by which they mean, by the way, addressing the North-South divide, particularly ending London's hegemony. And that's, I think, you know, we'll talk about that a bit more, but they've got some very clear views about what that ought to look like. So does Labour fare any better? And this is where it's, it's difficult. Um, Labour is also unlucky, but the words that were used most often to describe Labour right now were invisible, absent, quiet and reserved. Much lower scores. One person said to me, um, Ian, who's a very smart young plumber in Accrington who I interviewed, first time round and went back to, and he said, I don't know who Keir Starmer is, what he believes in or why I should vote for him. He hasn't given me a reason to do that yet. So in short, I found a year on no real regrets, um, but people flagging some real issues. And I'll, perhaps I'll end here. This is Nigel, who himself runs an SME, actually a small building firm um, in Stoke. And this is what he said to me. I'm not really a Tory. I felt I wasn't being true to myself when I voted Tory, but I voted to get Brexit done. And I've put in brackets for, note for myself, despite the fact that he voted Remain, actually. Um, he voted to get Brexit done. Also, Corbyn finished me off. Boris seemed decisive that he'd get us through Brexit come hell or high water. But I feel now there's nowhere to go and no one sticking up for working class people. Perhaps if I leave it there, and I'm really happy to sort of pick up on those points or anything else. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. And lots and lots of food for thought and debate there. Um, and I think I might pick up on the last point about uh, leadership in particular. And this that, that quote, Corbyn finished me off, because I think that was exactly what I found in 2019. Um, in 2017, I think there's a quote in your book from Graham uh, Jones, uh, who experienced people telling him in 2017, get back down there and get rid of him. And I think that was what a lot of us felt, that we were on kind of borrowed time. Wagging their fingers at him on their doorsteps. And, and, and the rest. Yeah, and the rest, yeah. Um, and I mean, actually, you know, in, in 2019, you know, some of the language was really, really visceral. Um, for me in Redcar, and I appreciate it was different in different areas, but it was four to one on the doorstep, uh, Corbyn to Brexit. Um, and say so the, the the kind of yeah. vitriol people had was was quite uh, astonishing. Um, yeah, yeah. Perceived lack of patriotism, perception of extremism, um, they didn't really like the kind of left wingness. A lot of people here perhaps had what they sensed was a history and they remembered, um, you know, what that had done to Labour Party before that people actually kind of talked to me about that on the doorstep um, and say, you know, security, high spending policies, and the anti-Semitism which cut through as well. And yet, as you say, Boris Johnson was the guy who they felt who got it. Um, I had a quote from Rekha from someone saying, he's actually bringing pride back to my country. And it's the first person I've heard say that Britain's gonna be good again. What What is it that people in Red Bull are looking for from their political leaders? And how did we get it so badly wrong last time? Yeah, and, and how did, in, in contrast, get you know Boris Johnson get it right? And I mean, you've got to hand it to him that he did. And I think it is about having a really, really clear message that really touched a nerve with people. And it was one thing, I remember actually in during the election, we did a big project, Britain Thinks did a big project for the BBC, where we brought together, I think it was about a hundred um, swing voters to Crewe in the big old railway uh, station at Crewe. Um, and we had this huge group of people. And um, one thing I did with them was I said to them, right, I'm gonna count to three, and I want you all to just, you know, we, we by then like two weeks into the election campaign, I want you all to think of an election slogan and chant it out. So I go one, two, three, and literally as one, they all chanted, get Brexit done. So I said, right, okay, that's okay. That's the Tories slogan. Now I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to think about the Labour slogan, one, two, three. And there was this sort of embarrassed silence. And then a few people sort of murmured things and they were all saying slightly different things. And there was just this, so what he had was this clarity um, around, um, you know, around what he was going to do. It was a very straightforward message. It really sort of, you know, touched a chord uh, with people and it, it worked. So, you know, answer to the broader question, what do people want from, from leadership um, of any party? They want a really clear message and really clear mission. And that, by the way, is where they're a little bit disappointed now in Boris Johnson, because he seems to have lost that clarity of messaging. Well, again, one person I went back to in December said, 
the decisive bit of his nature seems to have gone missing, which I thought was interesting. Um, so, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to dwell a bit on the, this point about sort of patriotism that you mentioned as well, because um, that was, you know, a huge issue here. Um, and again, you know, we were going to always struggle with a, a leader who, um, you know, wouldn't speak the national anthem. In areas like this, we have big armed forces communities here. Um, did La How did Labour manage to so badly vacate the space of a positive patriotism and a positive vision of this country that just didn't, you know, we just couldn't resonate with, with people? And is that something kind of inherent that we struggle with on the left? Um, and, and how important is that to, to Red Wall voters? I really think it is. And I, I think this comes down to this, this juxtapositioning, really, of of the, you know, to, to, to use again, just to stress, these are their words, not mine, but the snooty London graduates who look down on them and them. And this is one of those areas where they feel that that, you know, collides. And of course, Brexit, Brexit was many things, but one of the things Brexit struck, struck, in, stuck into with them was this sense of patriotism, this sense of putting your country first, um, sense of believing in, in a, you know, in a, in a particular kind of future for your country. And I think there are so many different things that Labour had done over the years that suggested to them not only was Labour not proud of being British, but Labour was potentially even a bit ashamed of being British. And of course, that's where you get into the, the whole culture wars thing, which I think, you know, on whole was not something that preoccupied any of the people that I spoke to. Um, in fact, I think I, t I tell a story, which I'm perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll tell now, because I do think it's quite instructive. It's not about patriotism, but it's, it's a similar point, which was that when I was doing the field work that I did in Accrington and Oswaldwistle and those areas up in Hindburn in Lancashire, um, it was at a point in the leadership contest where there was a week where, um, where the debate was dominated by where the different candidates stood on the trans debate, right? And so, and several of them had picked that up a little bit. And one of the guys turned to me, and I, I, it's really important to say this was said with absolutely no sense of malice or making a point, or it was a genuine baffled question. He said to me, how many trans people are there in, in Britain? Oh, and, which was a question to which I didn't know the answer, actually. Um, and said I didn't know the answer. And he said, you know, just like, I just don't understand why this is such an important, um, point and it wasn't that it wasn't that there wasn't sympathy for trans people um, but it was simply like there are so many things to be done why is this the focus and I think going back to the point about leadership Anna and back to Corbyn one of the things that I heard most often about Corbyn was just like this this shopping list of stuff and it meant that there was no sense of focus and it really reminded me of you know the 97 election where we crystallized everything down to that pledge card five things and I remember doing focus groups and by like halfway through, um, I would say, what would Labour do differently if they were in power? And the swing voters in my focus groups could literally name those pledges. They could just trot them out. They were really familiar with them. And I think that's also very instructive. Mm, thank you. And just staying on the, the culture wars issue, because um, this is something that fascinates me, because we have two Conservative MPs sort of in, in the bit where I live who both are very, very focused on this. And I wondered if there's something in their polling that's telling them this is the best thing they have to connect with former Labour voters who switched last time around. They uh, Facebook and tweet constantly on issues around kind of um, statues, Black Lives Matters, you know, the North South divide stuff. Um, th there's a, a they talk about issues of sort of local pride, like Palmo, which is a local dish around here. Uh, my current Tory MP was in Parliament with a Union Jack um, sort of face mask and was kind of, you know, doing a Facebook discussion on that. Yeah. I think they feel very strongly that what um, what won them the, the sort of culture war, if, if that was part, you know, part of the election in December 2019, is something they have to keep furrowing, a rich seam they have to keep furrowing because we continue to see them do that. And then I'd say to you, what, what is Labour's response? Do we just ignore it? Do we engage properly on these kind of difficult issues immigration national you know patriotism uh, security do they do people want to see us talking more about this stuff or is it something that we just walk away from yeah I, I would separate out um patriotism from almost everything else in the list you just mentioned I think that has to be central I think it has to be incredibly important um you know I, I think it's you know having a, a patriotic take on the kind of country that Labour wanted to see and what was different about it was one of the reasons that Labour won in 97 um, and I think you know and, and continued to win I think it really mattered um, 
I think that's absolutely bread and butter. You have to, you know, as an opposition party, you have to be able to give an account of what, of what the country you love, you want to see l looking like, you know, what your vision is for Britain. And if you can't do that, you'll never win. I really think that. Um, and I think, you know, if you, if you, and if you don't show that you love your country, the Red Wallers will never love you. And I, I really feel that. With the other things, I think it's really interesting because I think that this, I think what they're doing, it, I'm guessing this, I mean, I've no idea what's behind the, the, their strategy, but my guess is they are just hoping to get a rise out of Labour, right? Um, but I think, and, and so it's a sort of bear pit, but I think it's as much of a, a risk strategy for them as it is for Labour, because I think they potentially run the risk of looking as if these are the things they care about too, uh, because it's just not where voters are. It's not what voters want to talk about. They want to talk about jobs. They want to talk about their local community, the high street, the, you know, whether they've got litter on the ground, whether there's a safe place for their kids to play, whether their kids have got a future. These are things they want to talk about. The NHS, can it cope? And I think that by, by talking about, you know, the other side being preoccupied with Black Lives Matter or whatever it is that you want, I think that you run, run the risk of looking like you are focused on the wrong things too. Great, thank you very much. Um, and then uh, finally, before I do open things up, I'd just like to talk a little bit more about local identity, which was something that came through very strongly in your, in your book is very important, but particularly around, I think, local government um, and the sense that, you know, all, all the issues you've talked about, how difficult things have been for people in the last 10 years, we know as a result of austerity, we know red wall areas have been hit twice as hard um, by austerity, you know, the, the, particularly their local authorities compared to areas down south. Why is it that Labour is seen as the establishment in these areas and, do you think local government is the way to start to turn some of that tide with tangible things that people can see either in opposition or you know delivering on high streets and and, and so on in, in the local area I, I think it is and i think i think regional mayors also are potentially important here so in some of the places that i went to not everywhere but some of the places i went to that the, the the Labour Council was held up as an example, a bad example of what of what Labour would be like in government. So obviously, if you don't have an experience of Labour government, and let's face it, Labour has now been out of power for quite a long time, lost four elections on on on, on the trot. Um, I think that you know you will look at where Labour is in power to draw your conclusions about what Labour might be like. So it really, really, really matters. And I think that those uh, those regional mayors also have got real cut through. So um, I mean, you and I were chatting before before we, we opened the, the call up about Ben Houchen, who is uh, the Tees Valley mayor, who um, was mentioned by a lot of the people that I talked to, and is seen almost like as a bit of a kind of rock star um, locally because he's seen to have you know kind of taken a couple of issues, got to grips with them, said he'd do something, actually done it. Um, you know, Andy Burnham actually also came through very, very positively. And it, actually, when I went back and re-interviewed people, some of the people in that area, so Hindburn doesn't particularly associate itself with Manchester. For God's sake, it takes nearly an hour and a half to get there on the train, which is one of the big issues that people have. Um, you know, one of the chaps told me that his son had gone to live in Manchester and he was like as sad as if his son had gone to live in Australia or something. I mean, it was felt so far away. But... Andy Burnham suddenly through COVID and when the tear thing was coming in and people felt that was very unfair and were very worried about what was happening to them compared with other places, it felt that he was speaking for their area in a very effective way, actually. So I think, yes, there are some opportunities where the Labour is in power or in opposition at a local level because the local area really matters. As I say, it's a group of people who live their lives in, in quite a small, place mostly they've lived all their lives there their parents their grandparents they come from there it's part of them it really matters thank you great i'm going to open it up to um questions now we've got a few in, in the chat box um and i've had a couple of um sort of direct messages as well so and obviously we've got a lot of people on the call who are in these areas and have represented these areas as well so i thought i might start start with them um uh, baroness hillary armstrong who obviously represented northwest durham um which you know it was was one of our another of our absolutely inconceivable and horrendous losses in 2019 um so hillary i don't know if you'd like to come in uh with a with a question or comment if you are able to unmute yourself. Do we have to unmute her? Oh, that's, oh sorry, ask to unmute. I think I need to. 
sometimes only you or yeah I'm hope. pressing ask to unmute oh, all right yeah. sorry and then, <laughs> okay um uh yeah I mean I think Northwest Durham was slightly different we should never have lost Northwest Durham even in a, in a red wall seat run and Corbyn and the local candidate who was imposed were a very big part of losing there. I've done some focus groups there, couldn't afford you Debbie I'm afraid. Um, and, uh, <laughs> Hillary. and there's a local there's a local guy who hasn't lived there since he went to university which is a point somebody else has made up there but his mum still lives in concert and he on early retirement has done a um, a, a master's and interviewed 400 people in the club in one of the clubs in um, concert and they'd all had a history of for 20 years voting Labour and this was for them the first time that they hadn't and Corbyn was a huge issue the manifesto was a huge issue but you're also right about Boris um, uh, and that they they thought Boris was a sort of cheeky chappy who yeah. Um, had a bit of affiliation with them, despite all of the uh, Eaton and all the rest of its stuff. Um, uh, but the, um, the whole issue of how Labour didn't represent them was very, very important and had forgotten the main things that they knew about. Um, the Tory MP says we would never have lost it if you'd still been the candidate because they still see you as a local who represented them and who knew them. So, um, you know, some of that is really important. I think now that's becoming more important than it ever used to be when I first started. Um, uh, we used to say you could do about 250 votes for the uh, local um, in those days. Uh, and now I suspect people will vote against somebody if they really don't feel they're part of what they're doing. But I wanted to push you on what expectations are on leveling up and what they see as disappointment. I know they talk about London, but um, I think that we need a bit more clarity on that. I do think that they don't really see us as in contention yet. Um, I think things are a little bit better, but they're up and down on that. And uh, I think that they see that I, I still think, certainly in Northwest Durham, their concern is that Kia hasn't sorted the party out yet, and they still got the loonies uh, telling them what to do. Um, so, uh, um, but I do think that we need to have a better view of what they see as levelling up, and what they what will what will disappoint them in that, that we can come in on. Mm -hmm. Great, mm -hmm. thank you, Hilary. Um, and I, I think I'm gonna bring in Sally Gimson because obviously Sally had um, a, a really interesting experience in Bassett, Bassett Law and has written a pamphlet on it as well for the Fabians. And I, so I thought, um, before we go back to Deborah, I'll take yeah. Sally and then um, perhaps uh, uh, Jamie Reed as well, who obviously um, represented one, a, a similar seat for, for, um, you know, for a period of time. Sally, over to you. I think I've asked you to unmute, hopefully. Yes. Hi. Um, yeah, no, it's great to be here. And um, all the things you say, Deborah, completely, absolutely what in my uh, uh, short time in Bassett Law um, picked up. And also when I went back and talked to everybody in the summer again to um, write the pamphlet. Um, and I quote, I definitely, I quote you particularly about the, the broadband, the free broadband and free yes. Wi-Fi for everyone in that. Um, as well. Um, so, and also what was striking, I think, in your book too, is that the Labour Party had never asked you to poll there before, and never asked you to ask what people's opinions there were for, and that this only happened um, with the loss of the Red Wall. Um, so I want to plug for my, think, my yes, pamphlet as I, well. <laughs> yeah, I never suggested it, it's on me too, I think, you know. I think uh, sorry? I didn't suggest it either. I mean, I think it's on me as well. I, I, I shouldn't, I don't want to feel like I'm saying nobody ever asked me. I mean, actually, I also could have said we should perhaps not be taking these seats for granted, and I never did. So, so 
Thank yeah, you. well, it's really interesting. And I think, yeah, I mean, I thought it was really, really interesting. Um, and that now actually we are suddenly taking these people, the, these people in these places seriously. Um, and But I wanted to sort of say, what do you think Labour should, what are the things Labour should be doing now in those seats to be taken Ooh. seriously? What should we be what should we be saying? I mean, obviously, Keir's putting the Union Jack behind him whenever he speaks, but uh, and talking about patriotism. But yeah. is what what should we be? What would the, what are the sort of three messages we should be putting forward in the next year to get heard? Thank you, and I'll just take one more, Deborah, before I get you to respond to those. So, uh, Jamie Reed uh, wanted to speak as well. Jamie, there, there you are. Thanks, Anna. <clears throat> um, brilliant stuff, Deborah. Can't argue with, with any of it. Um, and great to see so many people. Um, Again, a couple of things. How important is Englishness in these areas? Because I sense the real deterioration regarding our standing um, in the immediate aftermath of the Scottish referendum. Um, secondly, why did we never learn the lessons of the Copeland by-election when you couldn't have had a clearer canary in the coal mine about where our traditional voter base was going? Um, and third, um, this happened in the US in the 60s, um, with the Democrats, we now have 24 million white working class Southern American um, uh, people voting for the Republican Party year in, year out, based upon cultural values against their own economic best interests, said the smug metropolitan liberal. But why is it taking us so long to get our heads around these issues when they're so obvious and have been for 10, 15 years? Mm. Great. Thank you. Yes. Gosh, okay, shall I have a go at answering some of those? I don't know. Please, yeah, <laughs> as much some as, them, as you want to respond to. quite you. hard. Um, so, yeah, I'll start with Hillary's point, um, which is what, you know, what, what are the expectations on levelling up particularly? I think there's one thing to say here, which is, as things stand now, anyway, levelling up anyway isn't an expression that people use or understand. So they will tend to, that might, might change, but right now they don't. And they, tend, they will tend to talk about fixing the North-South divide, um, and, you know, as, as you've already suggested, Hilary, that a big part of this actually is resentment towards London. When I found that when I explained what my take on what levelling up means, people found that somewhat implausible, actually. Um, they didn't really buy into, uh, you know, the Tories' sense that we could all kind of get better and we could all rise up to the set. That, that just meant nothing to people at all. In fact, rather, they see it as a bit of a zero-sum game. They feel that London has sort of taken all the pies and left them short. And the only way that their place can get better is if something's taken away from London. And I, I you know, I, I mean, I can't really state it any more boldly than that. What we do with that, I think, is much, much trickier. I think there's a long standing. It's a bit like I, I was talking to a group last night, actually, doing a similar talk, but with much more of a Brexit focus. And one of the things I said was that when I first left my job in advertising and started working with Labour, one of the first things I did was uh, it was a project for um, the European Labour MEPs. And it was looking at attitudes towards Europe. And one of the things I, I remember going back, and this is in the 80s, and saying the trouble is people can list all the negatives about Europe, but none of the positives, um, because nobody's ever bothered to make the case. And I think in a way, the same is true of London to the rest of the country. Nobody has ever bothered to say, well, you know what? Yeah, you know, people do, uh, do thrive in London. It's a very thriving city. It's a global city. It's all these things. And here's how you benefit. Here's what it means to you. Um, now, it might be that case hasn't been made because it's not a very strong case. <laughs> Um, but I think it's quite, you know, it's quite important to flag. And is that your dog? <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Just working out how to mute myself now. <laughs> I'll mute my dog. And, and certainly people, people feel that, um, you know, they've got quite high expectations. They think they've been promised something now. Um, and whilst COVID cuts a little bit of slack for the government because they understand that, you know, other things have had to be done first, they are expecting to see their local area improve. Um, and, and by that, I, I mean, you know, their, their local town centre to look better, um, you know, more jobs, manufacturing, et cetera, et cetera, which, which kind of leads into the uh, Sally's question about what, what Labour should be doing now, because I think it is those things. I mean, I think, I think the overarching, there are two overarching messages. 
One is about patriotism and Labour having a really clear vision for the country, the country that it loves and wants to be part of. Um, and the other is something that was touched on earlier in the conversation, uh, and Hillary touched on it too, which is this sense of being, of understanding you and being of you as well. And I mean, this would be a very controversial thing to do, but Labour could do worse than saying, we don't want anybody to stand in a seat unless, you know, unless they, if they're already there, fair enough, but you know, somebody stand in a seat unless they really do come from that seat and they're part of that seat and they understand it and they're, you know, um, and so that you couldn't do the thing anymore of being that MP who, you know, sort of stayed in a hotel overnight once a month and, and, and the rest of the time never went there. Um, and then there are some really specific pledges and I think those are all quite bread and butter stuff there's things about jobs there's things about apprenticeships there's things about opportunities for young people there was a very big theme in the places I went to about manufacturing and somehow giving people things to be proud of in their local community and there is something about new sustainable industries and, and investing in those and making sure that they go to those places um what else Jamie asked about um funny enough Englishness I didn't hear one person talk about Englishness. I heard them talk a lot about Britishness. And somebody asked me last night, actually, if I felt that, you know, if the union were to be, were to collapse and Scotland say was to, to you know, would people in the Red Wall care? And I think they care a lot, actually. I think they care a lot about Britain. I just didn't hear that much about Englishness. I'm not saying it's not a thing, but um, I, I didn't hear it mentioned once. Um, Oh, one other thing Jamie said, actually, I just do want to go back on because I think, yeah, I mean, like everybody looking at what happened in the States, I think, I think there are some really interesting lessons there. I think there are some watch outs too. And I think that the Democrats will find some watch outs because, you know, 75 million people voted for Trump. And Lord Ashcroft did a poll last week that showed that those people who had voted for Trump on the whole thought that he was a great president. They didn't approve of everything he'd done in his personal life, but they thought he was a great president. That is a big mountain to climb there. You know, that's going to be really tough. But I think, Jamie, you specifically asked something about, you know, voting in favour of cultural issues against their own best economic interests. Now, that might be your judgment, but I don't think that any of the people that I met felt that they had voted against their best economic interests. Now, you might feel they're wrong, but I don't think that anybody thought that. I felt that they were very much voting in their own best economic interests in their view so thanks and, and on on that note then I, I might go straight to vicky roberts who has a question on um you know the reality once brexit starts to affect people in this area and whether that would change vicky would you like to to ask your question sorry <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that yeah um i mean we've only just started to see uh, some of the um the effects of Brexit coming through the system. I wonder once they start to start to build up a little further down the line, whether the people that you spoke to might change their views on the Tories' decisiveness in this respect, and um, and you know, and their clear message. How clear a message is it when all of the the wrinkles start to work their way through? Thank you. And um, then, sorry, can I can I move on? I'd say I'll, I'll take three at a time. So we are sort of pushing through the time now. Uh, Mark Grayling had a question on education. I did. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, that's Good. great. Um, yeah, uh, is the, uh, my question is about the, the real divide in the country and, and, and whether it's a, it is purely about educational attainment. And I mean, I, I've been in a Red Wall area for a long time. I've worked for Red Wall MPs. Um, and I've seen our bright young activists at 16 get to 18, go off the university, never come back, become mm. part of the metropolitan elite, mm. sometimes get parachuted back into, into, <laughs> red, into red wall seats. Because those are the people who, who we, you know, who, who we've done it for. Um, mm. um, yeah. But, you know, and, and the voting patterns seem to be about, you know, whether, whether you've got a degree or not. And, and Labour attracts graduates and doesn't attract non-graduates. And how do you overcome that? Mm. Thanks, Mark. And then finally, um, Shanti Roos had a question, which I thought was particularly interesting around the role of Facebook and social media as well. 
Yeah, I study this a lot. I, I, do, I, I do experiments where I try and push out the Labour message and there's sometimes a non-Labour message, so a sort of a more anti-Tory message and try and see what, what responses you get. And I specifically focus on some of the Red Bull uh, areas. And I'm just curious what, what you think, where do people get their news? How they, do they form their opinions? And do you believe that these sort of Facebook groups um, because they can be quite big and quite, you can get people who normally don't look at politics. Do you think that is a tool that we could use? Mm -hmm. And then particularly, is it, do you believe, I actually personally think that some of the people are so anti-labor baseline that if you come up with a labor message, they think they straight away have their anti-anti standard response. And I just wondered if we could come to, the, come to them with the non, not with a, a labor logo on labor, labor or um, brand on it and in a different way and I wonder if anyone is doing these sort of things looking at that what what would be the best way to win them back basically. Mm, brilliant great questions Thank okay you. um so Vicky's first then the, the reality of Brexit it, interestingly so the group I was chatting with last night asked exactly that question and I think it's a really important one to think of um I, I don't actually know is, 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 is the straightforward answer. I really don't know. It's very hard to, to tell how people are going to respond, but I actually think that it is unlikely that people will be persuaded uh, that Brexit was a mistake anytime soon. And I think in a way, the messages I see from, uh, from most kind of strong Remainers Oh, by the way, you know, I, I voted Remain, you know, just, just to be really clear here. Um, but very often what I'm seeing at the moment is a lot of stuff on social media and so on with kind of like, well, who knew, you know, so this has happened, what a surprise. And you know, basically the best way to persuade people to your point of view is not to tell them that they're idiots, I think, or not to say, well, I was right all along, look at this. And, and I think that at the moment, People can't resist that. And it's sort of, and I think that just compounds the problem. Meanwhile, you know, on the whole, Brexit itself was not a particularly important issue for people, right? But it, it kind of symbolized a bunch of things that, that, that were important. And dislike of the EU was quite a powerful thing in the mix. Now, what's happening at the moment with vaccinations and AstraZeneca and everything is frankly a PR gift for Boris Johnson. Um, you know, so I think anybody who thought, well, the EU are a bad lot and we're well out of it, will be thinking that even more strongly at the moment and feel quite vindicated. So uh, it's hard to know how things will pan out further down the line, but I feel that we're some way from being able to use that as, 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 as a powerful argument. Um, Mark asked about the education divide. And yeah, I mean, I, th I, think you're, I think you're right to raise that. And I think what I found was that the same person who had talked to me about snooty London graduates, one, one of the people that I interviewed was um, a, a guy up in Darlington called Russell. And he, his son had gone to university, first family and first person in the whole family to go. He was so proud of his son, so thrilled and delighted and talked about him such a lot. Son's now a teacher. He, was he could not have been happier. Um, so it's, it's quite a mixed bunch of feelings, but you know, I think in the end, Labour has to be able to connect with people. Everybody I spoke to worked with their hands or they were carers. You know, David, as David Goodhart would have it, they were hands and heart workers rather than head workers. If Labour can't connect with those people, then it has a real problem. You know, it has to be able to find a way of reaching out to those people and saying to those people, we can do something for you and be on your side, I, I would say. Um, Shanti's point, I think you're right about the opportunity that Facebook offers. And I think that uh, quite a lot of the people that I spoke to got a lot of their ideas through Facebook. Um, and in fact, just chatting to Anna, um, uh, you know, b before you all joined the call, we were talking about how effectively, um, you know, the, 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 the Tees Valley mayor uses Facebook, for example, that, that was really clear. I think it's also interesting what you say about using, getting some of those messages over without potentially being tainted by the Labour brand. However, what I would say to that is that in the end, if Labour wants to win an election, it has to rehabilitate the Labour brand. It has to. Uh, you know, Keir Starmer is not enough 
you can't have a great leader and a, a, a you know a, a shit brand that's sort of dragging them down so i think there has to be some effort and energy put into that actually thanks um great i think we've just i'm going to squeeze three more in if you can be really really brief please so we've got bill esterson uh mohammed jessa and fiona o'farrell so um bill if you could kick us off please uh, thanks very much, Anna. Um, Anna and I grew up in North Kent and then went and became MPs in the north of England. Um, I was going to say, it's a similar point to the one Jamie made. We saw this real shift happening, possibly even as early as the 50s in, in parts of southern England. And Giles Radici's southern discomfort is a is worth a, a revisit for anybody who hasn't hasn't done, done recently. But um, something I'm hearing parroted again and again from Tories now, and I heard it in the election, I heard it in this constituency, just not in the same scale that we, we saw in, in, in um, seats we lost, um, that uh, Labour, you, um, Anna mentioned at the start, Labour had let you down. Um, and the Tories who are in Parliament now are repeating that Labour has let you down. And, you know, and, and they're getting away with it in, in Parliament again and again and again. And they've been in government for 10 years. You know, how on earth do they get away with saying it and pushing it on us uh, and it's it, it's us that's paid the price for it politically? Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thanks. Um, Mohammed. Um, good evening. Thank you for, for the meetings. Just quick questions. Uh, I mean, since we've been elected uh, deputy and leader for one year, and uh, uh, what's your assessment about our leadership, internal communication, engagement, and also uh, try to build in visions and the key things for me, uh, I was happy to the representation of the leadership, one in London, one outside London. But the question, uh, the, the key thing is in how the message can go down to the north is to north -west, where we select a lot of seats. So we need message to go to down to the ordinary diverse community, how that could be one, and your assessment for leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. And uh, Fiona. Um, thanks, Anna, and thanks, Deborah. Really, really interesting. Um, discussion and my question is just about sort of government corruption and how you define patriotism because I don't really think it's very patriotic to be um, giving lots of money to your mates which is what's been going on over the last year with the COVID crisis so is there a way for us as Labour to sort of change the narrative around what patriotism actually means um, and you know it's not patriotic to take taxpayers money and spend it with your mates um, mm. And sort of, is there a way for us to make that connection and, and redefine what patriotism means in the same way that Brexit is damaging and going to damage people's businesses? Right. If you, if Thank your you. position yourself is patriotic, that's not that's not what you should be doing. Thanks, Thanks Fiona. Thank you. Okay, shall I try and run through those really quickly? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Fiona. Perhaps if I start with Fiona, and I'll work backwards. Um, the point about uh, patriotism. As I said, I, I think I said before, I mean, I think one of the things that Labour must do is to identify its old brand of patriotism, what patriotism means. Um, it also, by the way, I think needs to clearly develop its own attack line. I'm not sure, honestly, what is the best attack line for uh, on, on, on this government at the moment. I think it's quite hard to figure that out in the very strange circumstances that we're in at the moment, but it will need to do that in time as well. Um, in the end, the, some of the specific points you make about corruption and so on, I, I sort of feel in some ways are better made by others. Um, it might be better if, you know, there will be, I presume, some sort of review that analyzes performance through the coronavirus crisis. It might be better if something, come, you know, comes out of that or um, I feel Labour just banging on about that will maybe just feel like they would say that, wouldn't they? I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe that's a cop out. Um, Mohammed's point, forgive me, because the sound was really bad. For some reason, you were cutting it in and out. And I, I, but I think you're, you're, you, it's about what's the message to our diverse community, isn't it? Is that yeah, you're, and, you're, and the you're leadership, you're how the leadership is getting on? Yeah. Oh, sorry. okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, sorry, Mohammed. So well, the diverse community point, if I can just touch on that briefly, I, I think in a way it's a little bit, I would answer that exactly the same way as I'd answer the Red Wall. It is about being of that community and you know kind of from that mm. community and having plenty of senior representatives who clearly okay. are so um and i think without that uh, that that it's not going to work right um how is the leadership doing that was the other question you asked then okay i missed that because i think it was cutting in and out um so what keir starmer has very clearly done is to uh flag that he is not jeremy corbyn um and that is you know that is a 
blessed relief, I think, to a lot of the Red Wall voters. They've noticed that. They think that he is a decent guy. Um, but I would say he now needs to do much more to set out his stall. And as I, I think I quoted earlier, uh, the, 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 the plumber from Accrington who said to me, you know, he seems like a decent enough bloke and he's not Jeremy Corbyn, but I don't know what he cares about. I don't know what he stands for. And I don't know why I would vote for him. And that all those questions must be answered or he's not going to vote for him. So that's that, you know, so I think that's really clear. Um, last question of Bill and Bill, I've got to admire your color coded bookcase. <laughs> That's extraordinary. It's, it's so on trend, I believe, but I don't know how you find your books, but anyway, but it looks amazing. Um, but uh, my, um, my wife has a secret, Deborah, I've got to do yay, something to you. Somebody likes it. <laughs> it's, 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 it's <laughs> really, she's, she's chuffed a bit hearing you say that. <laughs> it looks so great, especially the orange bit, matching the wall and everything. It's just fantastic. Um, anyway, um, I think, yeah, the point that you made about Labour let you down, and I talked earlier about rehabilitating the brand, and I can see a few people have said, how does Labour rehabilitate the brand? And one thing that I want to say, and maybe I'll, I'll end with this, is one of the things that really struck me, and I talked about this in the book, was how damaged people's perceptions were of the Labour government that was in power for many years, and how little they felt it had delivered to them, rightly or wrongly, in my view, wrongly, and I think that Labour has allowed that narrative to develop. And I don't see any way that you can get people to vote for you again if you are going to trash what went before in that way and not celebrate the, the achievements and, and the strengths. It's like saying, buy this car, you know, like a car manufacturer saying, buy this car. The last one I made was shit, but I've improved it a bit. I mean, it's not going to work, you know. And I think that that I think rehabilitating the brand has to have at its heart, rehabilitating some of the achievements of the Labour government. Right, thank you so much. And I think that's a really important point to end on. So I think one of the things that really jumped out at me in your book was the statistic that 76% of the new Tory voters were clear that Labour would need to change significantly. And the words I heard, complete overhaul, and before they'll consider voting for them again. So we have a huge, huge challenge there. Keir mm. is doing his bit, but um, you know, there's a big mountain to climb for us to be in the sort of position we need, the sort of swing that we need to get into government. So your book and your thoughts tonight will help us. <laughs> and um, I'm really, really grateful to everybody who's been on this call, all the fantastic questions and contributions. I'm sorry we didn't get to bring uh, everyone in but hopefully this is just the start of the conversation and we can keep building from here so thank you all so much for coming thank you deborah for, for your, all your insights and thank you very much to smes for labor for for organizing this event thank you and uh, take care everyone and stay safe thank you well done, well done. thank you cheers bye, bye. thank you